than to come together and to look into God's word. That's what I intend to do with you here for the next couple of minutes. And uh, speaking of God's word, the, the message this morning and this evening deals with, quote unquote, the law of Christ. And Galatians 6.2 is the verse that I, that I chose uh, to start out with just to kind of set the tone. And it says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And, and really my point, the thing I want to take from that is that if, we're, if there is a law of Christ to be fulfilled, well then there must be a law of Christ. When we hear about the law, and especially in pertaining to the word of God, oftentimes we're talking about the, the Mosaic law. We're talking about Old Testament things. And uh, the, the law of Christ, when we think of uh, this, this statement here in Galatians 6.2, let's think about the context of that, of that verse. And it was being written to the church at Galatia. These that were hearing this were, we can infer that they were, you could understand that they were Christians. They were, had been obedient to the gospel. And if you go back and look leading up, you know, there, there, are some, there are some problems that they had. And those were being brought forth by the writer. And uh, helping them to understand that there needed to be some things that needed to be done a little bit better. This idea of bearing one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, it, it can't stand alone. That statement can't stand alone. Most statements in the scriptures, they, they don't stand alone, but they're held up by the entirety of the scriptures, the context of the scriptures. But in understanding that there is a law of Christ, we want to delve a little bit into that today because there's a lot of confusion there's a lot of confusion over what should I, what should I follow. The, as we mentioned this morning in the Bible study, at least I asked the question, which one of us came to Christ by natural revelation? Did we climb out of our mother's womb and then pick up a Bible and, 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 and just naturally come to the knowledge of, uh, of the truth? It doesn't happen that way. We can't learn it by osmosis, as my seventh grade science teacher used to say. That we had to actually open our books and we had to read the things that were in it. And the same is true with the scriptures. We have to come to that time where we understand what we're reading and we have to come to that time where it pricks our heart, where we understand the, the difference between good and evil. When when we read those things, it starts to bother us that we're not in alignment with it. The law of Christ is different than what we see in the Old Testament times. It's better, and we'll get to that, we'll get to that uh, in the lesson. We'll not give away too many of my points. But uh, oftentimes there are people today that try to bind those things of the old onto the time that we are living in now, and that is just not possible. And, and if, if we look into the scriptures and, and take them in their context and understand the, the sort of general timeline of how things happened, then we can come to that understanding that there's, a, there's the old law and there's the new law. The new law which we are under and the things that we must do. So as we look a little bit into the law of Christ, we understand first of all that it is not the law of Moses. You know, some, some today, as I already mentioned, are uh, a little bit misguided, maybe a lot misguided, in the thinking that they, that they need to do the things that are found in the old law. And the interesting thing is, is that even those that would ascribe to those ideas, uh, if you do some, if you do some uh, observation, you'll find that they don't come anywhere near keeping all of those things that you find in the old law. It's one of the reasons why we needed a new law because they were, it was a burdensome thing. It was a difficult thing to keep. And uh, oftentimes people don't have any idea what they're saying when they say that you need to keep all these things that are in the old law. 
And these are an, indeed misguided souls. And, and, and I don't say that in a way to put them down. I say that to remind us that they need some guidance. And just like we needed guidance at different times in our lives, uh, if you are sitting here today and you're in Christ and you've bur been buried in the waters of baptism, having named him uh, and understanding who he is and, be and having been willing to repent of your sins and turn away from those old ways, if you stand, sit here today or stand, uh, you're here in Christ, then somebody helped you along the way. Someone guided you. And uh, once that guidance takes place, you can open the scriptures and you can look and, and work together with your brethren, and we still guide each other. There are things that, uh, that I learn uh, every week when I come together with you. I hope that as you come together, as we come together, we all learn something and take something out of the out of this uh, time that we have together. That's the purpose. But the law of Moses was taken away. And it is no longer. And if we look at Colossians chapter 2, and we'll read uh, verse 14, and I'll read uh, just a few verses after that. By all means, read more. Uh, on, on your own time, you know, make a note and read this. This pretty, this pretty well nails... Nails it shut, as it, as it were. Nails the coffin shut. The law of Moses has been taken away. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, uh, the, the, the old law it was difficult, it was tough. It was difficult to, to keep on a daily basis. Picking up there, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, trium triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new month or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Going back there to verse 16, and, and you know, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding festival or new month or Sabbaths. Those are all of the, that's speaking of, the, of all of the feasts and so on that were kept under the old law. And I've, in my time, I've come across, uh, I, I have talked with those that, that believe that they need to keep those feasts. That in order to be, uh, to be uh, pleasing to the Lord, that you need to keep all of the feasts that we find in, in, in the old law. And again, that was a burdensome thing to do. And there's many more things that, incidentally, these people that I most recently talked to, they keep all the feasts, but they don't do all of the other things that are involved with the old law. Because they've, uh, uh, they're picking and choosing verses, that, and they're trying to make those verses stand alone without the context of the, of the scriptures. The old law has been done away with. And uh, when someone tells us that, well, we need to keep, keep the feast of so-and-so uh, and such and such, we, we, we refer to them, we should refer them to Colossians 2, at verse 16. This law was done away with, and it, and it, and it is no more. In Hebrews 8, uh, 10, starting at verse 8, uh, we read previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. There is no more need for the law of Moses. The things that were are no longer, and we have a hope in Christ that we should be so thankful for. We live in a time, we live in a, a time where we can take hold of Christ in, in such, when you, when you think about it, it's really quite an easy thing to do. Uh, the difficulty comes in placing your faith, in gaining that faith, in placing your faith in Christ, and, uh, and what that really truly means. You know, it's easy to stand up in front of a group of people and say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. 
it's easy to say, yep, I'm not going to sin anymore. And it's easy to go ahead and get in the waters of baptism and, and get yourself wet and to come up out of there. But the difficulty comes in actually doing those things that we say. And that's, and that's the thing that we must all grab a hold of. This new law is in so many ways so much easier. But it still requires us to be faithful. Faithful until death, if you will, as we often talk about Revelation 2, at verse 10. We must remain faithful until death. And that, that, that is the difficult part. But, but this uh, law of Christ, it is not the law of Moses because it was taken away. We've already kind of mentioned the idea that the, the law of Moses was not profitable. It wasn't helpful uh, to that end. And uh, there again... Another reason why it was taken away. Hebrews 7, starting at verse 18, says, For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing of a better hope through which we draw near to God. What a wonderful statement. A better hope. You know, God made an improvement. He allowed us to be able to take hold of that hope through Christ. It was always in the plan. And as when we studied previously, if you've been in our Thursday night Bible studies, I believe it was pre-COVID, so a while ago now, we studied, we studied this and studied Hebrews. And we talked about it being basically that the law, the old law was kind of pushing things forward waiting for Christ, waiting for that sacrifice, waiting until all of the things that were said that needed to be done were done in, in God's time. And those things had to be done uh, and for this sacrifice to be, to be successful. And it was once for all. We have that sanctification through Christ once for all. There, we don't have to do anything else. And, and going back again to Colossians 2, that's another reason why we don't have to be worry about being judged and food or and drink or regarding festival or new moons or Sabbaths. You know, we don't have those same uh, restrictions on us, if you will. And it's something to be thankful for. And if you're sitting here today and you're outside of Christ, be thankful that you don't have to go through all of those things that we read about in the old law as well. Be thankful that, we have, that you have Christ that has laid his life down for you as well. That you can take hold of that hope and that you can live by that law of Christ. You know, it, it, again, we already mentioned there in Hebrews 7 uh, that the law of Christ is better. It is an improvement. You know, when we, when we look for uh, products out there in the world, you know, let's just, uh, looking out the back door, I can, see, I can see a car. And when we buy a car, we expect that the people that have designed that car have worked out the bugs and made it as good as possible. And then if we buy another one in three years, we expect that that one's going to be better than the old one. Otherwise, why would we, why would we need a new one? You know, we want things to get better in our life. We expect ourselves to do better in, in our workplaces and so on, in our jobs. We expect ourselves to get better at things that we practice and that we do. The Lord, the Lord made a better law. He made a better covenant for us. And in there in, in Hebrews 7 uh, verse 18 we, we, we read just a moment ago that the former commandment, because of its weakness and unprofitableness, because it was weak and it was unprofitable. We, we need to uh, be thankful that we no longer are under such a thing. And, and when we find those people that, is, as I mentioned in the last point, are misguided in the thinking that, that they need to keep those Old Testament things, we, we, need to, we need to guide them in the right direction and guide them to Christ. You know, there, there are so many today that still ascribe to that Old Testament law. And there are some that try to meld the two together. And, and that's just nonsensical. You know, when I think of, 
There are those that I know of, not that I personally know, but people that I know of that are highly intelligent individuals who are, who are uh, Jews. And they, uh, in looking at the scriptures and trying to read them both, reading both the New and the Old Testament, they can't let go of those old things. They want to hang on to, to those old things and put themselves under the bondage of that, again, unprofitable, uh, unprofitable uh, law. And realizing that there is a better hope. And we, we need to share that with whoever we come into contact with. If, if there's somebody that's living under that delusion that they need to be keeping feasts and so on, that they need to... Uh, stay in the old law we need to share them the good news share with them the good news of Christ that that we might have uh, that they might have that surety in in heaven you know as we look a little bit further Hebrews 7 uh, verse 22 reading just a few verses down says by so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant what comforting words. We have a better covenant by which we can live, by which we can be sanctified. We no longer need that old law. The law of Christ is not the law of Moses, and it is better. It also makes us free. As we've already kind of mentioned, uh, as we've been going down through this, uh, going down through this, it makes us free. It sets us free from the old, that which was burdensome. So if we go to uh, Romans here, let's go turn over to Romans 8 and read the first four verses. thought I had that one embedded in my notes, but it's not there. So Romans 8, that verse, uh, first four verses. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. To be, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. It goes on to tell us that the carnal mind is enmity, it is against God. You know, if we, and, and that's, that was the whole problem with Israel, is they couldn't bring themselves out of out of that physical mind. They wanted to see a physical kingdom. They wanted to see a physical king. And that's what they were seeking after. Christ brought them something better. And that is what is available to us today. All of us together in the, in the world today, we can look at that and we can take hold of that wonderful, that wonderful gift of everlasting life in Christ. And we don't have to we don't have to be under that bondage of the old law. The, the law of Christ makes us free. There's no condemnation in Christ. But you have to get there. You have to be in Christ in order to have no condemnation. To be sanctified, as you will, as we read just a few moments ago. The law of Christ makes us free. We should not continue in the flesh. You know, again, looking for the, a physical redemption. You know, when we, when we look at the, the scriptures and we, and, and we look at it and then we come away saying, well, I need to go do this, this, and this. I have to, I have to keep all of these things which are no longer needed. We're, in effect, putting ourselves back into bondage, but we, all are, we are also taking away the power of the Lord in our lives. The Lord's will is going to be done. The Lord's will is that each man and woman on this earth come to the knowledge of truth. 
come to the knowledge of truth, worship him in spirit and in truth, be obedient to his gospel, his law. That is his purpose. Christ was on this earth and went through the things that he did. You know, if you read through the life of Christ and see the prayers that he had in the garden, the prayers asking for the cup to be removed from him, that, that he wouldn't have to do these things, realizing that uh, being fully God and fully man, he, he felt every nail. He felt every lash. He felt every thing that was done to him by humankind. But he chose to be that sacrifice for us. Being nailed on the cross, he did away with that old law. And now we live under this law of Christ. And for that, we should be exceedingly thankful. You know, we must, of course, walk according to the Spirit. Oh, I found my note from eight, Romans 8 in the wrong place. John 6, verse 63, said it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. Uh, it, it is uh, such a comforting thought that we can look into the Word of God and that we can gain life, that we can look into and get the mind of Christ by putting these words in our hearts by studying and understanding what his will is. When we study and understand, we then realize that the scriptures in their entirety tell us of our history, and that's why we have the Old Testament, so that we can look back and see what has been done, and, we can, and it makes sense, and we can follow the lineage of Christ right up to, right up to Christ, understanding that he is the rightful Christ, that, that he is the one that God sent. We can see that all of, the, all of the things in the historical accounts have been taken care of. All of the prophecies had been fulfilled. We can look back there and see the mistakes of, of our Old Testament brethren, if you will. We can see the mistakes that they made. We can see that you know when it comes to Noah, having worked on the ark and preached to the people, with, and none of them heard. Only eight souls were saved uh, in all of that time. We can see that there were so many that made so many mistakes. We can learn from those mistakes, or we can just do them over again. And that seems to be uh, mankind's forte, is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. All of us have been there. I don't, again, say these things to put down others, but we've all been there. We've all been there. And those of us that have come to the knowledge of truth, we should have the zeal within us to share that with others, to, as we talked about this morning, to do unto others as you would have done unto you. I want to read Hebrews 9, starting at verse 11 here just for a moment, and then we'll, and then we'll, uh, end this lesson. Hebrews 9, starting at verse 11 says, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from, the, from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Wonderful words of encouragement for a Christian. Wonderful words of encouragement for those that are outside of Christ, that there is right in front of them, right within their grasp, this hope of heaven, being that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus there in Romans 8. At verse 1. Again, John 6.63. 6, 
It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. As you've looked into the word of God with me here this morning, are you willing to take hold of that life? As you've listened to the word, do you have an understanding that Christ is who he says he is? Do you know who Christ is? And are you willing to confess him before men? Are you unashamed of him? Are you willing to put away those old ways that you now understand separate you from Christ? Stop living in the carnal-minded world and start living in spirit and in truth for Christ are you willing to put all those things away because Christ has already given the sacrifice and we no longer have to have to fight and and uh, be dragged down by burdensome things there's nothing that we can do to save ourselves Christ has already done the work we just need to be obedient to him We need to be those that love him and seek after him. And because we understand he is who he is, we will gladly subject ourselves to baptism. Being buried in the waters of baptism, raised to walk in that newness of life because he said so. Because that was his requirement of his people, that they be be obedient to him. It's always been his requirement. You know, those that were prior to the day of Pentecost, prior to Christ and his new covenant, they had to live by that law. And God expected them to be obedient to him. We have something so much better. Will you take a hold of it today? Will you be buried in the waters of baptism? Will you choose Christ today? You know, if you're sitting here today and you'd like to put on Christ in baptism in a moment, you'll have an opportunity to come forward as we sing a song. If, if you are too embarrassed to come forward between, uh, in front of the whole, the whole group here, then, then, then catch one of us afterwards. Catch one of us afterwards and we can, we can make sure that that is done before it is everlastingly too late. If you're sitting here today and you've put on Christ, but you found the road difficult, that remaining faithful that we read about in Revelation 2.10 has been... A hard road. You need the prayers of the saints. You need the encouragement that is available to you by the Lord's design in his church. If you need that encouragement, then please, again, come forward as we stand and sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power?